the roots begin to spin and damage those plants, right. you know, because when you transplant them, now that plant's all mm -hmm. right. distorted right. in the hole, you know, so, um, so this system is made so that the root never curls, it just has a chance, they, they, the roots communicate with each other, they spread out through, and, you know, you pull them apart and put them in, so, um, while we use these trays, it's certainly not necessary to always use the plastic, and when we do have the plastic, they they get reused year after year after but, year and but, washed. But doesn't the form has well that too, of course. Mm -hmm. But also, doesn't the form has to be kept in place? For instance, obviously, it's easier to use this uh, machine to create these forms and just drop them in these boxes if you need to. You could, if you can move them. If you need to move them, that's the other thing. Is that generally we're moving them uh, just on a tray, so. Whatever the trays we use, old pieces of wood, in this case I'm using old pieces of polycarbonate mm -hmm. that, uh, old because they're rigid enough for me to carry around. I usually mm -hmm. carry 120 of those at a time or, or whatever I'm space. taping this, you don't mind, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's quite Great. okay. Come along. That's totally <laughs> Thank <fine>. you. <laughs> so, yeah, you can see here, this, you know, they don't really need to... Uh... Oh, wow! Uh -huh. They, they oh, wow. right, right. And now they're, they're living just fine. They're ready to be planted. Just oh, like that. wow. See the roots very protected. 120 plants or so per tray. And they don't need, you know... That solves that problem right away there. Yeah, so uh, the infrastructure is, is not necessary in, in that case. Wow. And it's simple. Wow. Yes. Why, why, are they, why, why is it... What's the purpose of the net? Um, birds. Oh, okay. Of course. Yeah, entirely. Oh, well, oh, so they do come in here too? Well, I try to keep them out, but it's difficult. Yeah. Oh, they get in. You know, when the roof opens here, they get in. Uh, we, we need to be able to ventilate, so okay. I'd rather have them out entirely. Um, we're chasing them around. <laughs> but this is trying also to find people to eat them. Yeah, okay. <laughs> this is an example of a mechanized um, uh, greenhouse, so to speak, yes. isn't it? So you have all these pipes, and that means that uh, there is a, a specific um, uh, time for water or watering, and it's probably automatic and things like that. Uh, we don't automatic water. We entirely, uh, in this system, see, this is a little more advanced system, and I'll show you another soon. Ah. So this space, there are, very, there are a few heaters that we use for this ah. house, and we just maintain this temperature in the winter to 32 degrees. So we just have the coldest zero degrees, basically, to keep the chill off. And that way we're not spending tens of thousands of dollars in propane. You're kidding. You mean this is, this, is, this is a cheaper version of the... I mean, obviously, this, this is... This is, is the low-energy model. We're working, actually, with Cornell right now to, do, to, to be able to hand over an example that we can share with other farmers to, wow. to uh, encourage them to get back into the greenhouse industry for vegetables. That's what is really the difficult thing is to... Uh, in the industry now, the industry is high energy, high input, and all of these guys now are up against very high fuel costs, and also competition from uh, imports of these products that they've been doing for so long, flower plants, uh, roses, bedding plants, all these different things, so that's become more and more difficult for them to maintain an economic. So we still have thousands of acres of greenhouses in the Northeast that we could use. So that's, we should be doing this. Cool. That's amazing. You you have uh, these uh, ventilations, uh, ventilators that you have all around, which mm -hmm. pretty much blows against each other. I mean, I see some here, over there, yeah. and so then there, in back the there. The air is circulating. It's circulating. And then the roof is open. So it gives us air oh, flow Oh, and the roof the is open. Uh -huh. huh. So it's an outdoor system, and that way we, in the middle of summer, it actually is about uh, two or three degrees cooler than outside because we get a light amount of shade. So where most greenhouses would be excessively hot in the right. summertime, the convertible system, which is really only just to have a longer louver. Which is good for the plants too. Oh, certainly it's like outside, but right. protected from it's all exactly. extremely. Amazing. And then if it does rain, we have other systems. And like I said, this is a, a high-tech, generally high-tech, even though it's pretty much bare bone system. Right, right, right. It is still So this is the idea. No, but that's, that's how high-tech is supposed to be. Simplify it. Right. You know, yeah. Well, we haven't done this for a hundred years. We've been 
the greenhouse industry is something that has turned into what it is. So the farmers have, in, especially in this area, within uh, several hundred miles of here, the organic and uh, sustainable practices of farming haven't been lost. People recognize right. that sort of thing. It's not the Midwest. Right. It's a very different kind of place. So um, the farming system hasn't changed, but in greenhouses, the example... We stopped growing a lot of diversified produce in greenhouses in the 20s. So imagine the kind of new technology we have since then to incorporate back in food system. The reason we got out of it was not because we couldn't do it, but because there was no necessity because of transportation and import of product from California and beyond. Uh, educate me, please, if you will. Uh, it seems that there are some issues with... Um environmentalists regarding greenhouses? So mm -hmm. Is this the same greenhouse emissions that they're talking about or not? Am I... Uh, well, greenhouse emissions meaning uh, amount of petroleum use and that sort of thing. A, a greenhouse, this greenhouse, uh, actually to give you an example of the heat system. So, the floor itself is all soil, deep soil. It's so, amazing. we're standing on concrete here, but right the concrete there. pad ends right here. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. So, amazing. And then it's all soil deep, all yeah. no bottom. So, the soil, even in the deepest part of winter, the, you know, the air temperature in here would be 30 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, but the soil will remain about 45 to 50 degrees. So, that surface temperature is radiating in the house. So, when I put on the heat, and these heaters, they don't have external exhaust. These are a very high-tech Dutch heater. They're actually very difficult to get in this country because no one does low-temperature greenhouse heat. The Dutch do for the bulbs and that sort of thing. So we bought this system, which uh, paid for itself, doubled itself in the first year I put this in. I saved, I, pay, I spent a fifth of the propane. And because it doesn't externally exhaust, it lets out CO2 and water vapor into the system. So that's not CO2 into the atmosphere, that's CO2 as a growth supplement for the plants. So the plants thrive on CO2, so you could continue to give them more, and they'll absorb that. That's not something that's going negative effect to the atmosphere. In fact, I would venture to say, even with petroleum use, we're easily carbon neutral in this house. Amazing. Oh, Amazing. Wow. Amazing. So, in terms of that, this is a way, as opposed to other greenhouse system like this, may spend $50,000 a month mm -hmm. at this same size in, in propane or natural gas or whatever they're using to heat the space. So, what kind of, uh, what kind of vegetables are you growing here? So, here there is uh, mixes. Because this produces year-round, we produce mm -hmm. things like fennel. fennel. Uh, here, these are uh, baby carrots. Oh, they're just coming in. They've been seeding very regularly. Uh, spinach is a very valuable crop for us. So we're constantly producing spinach. They look fabulous. Look at this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, and we also do a lot of micro greens like uh, baby kales, baby mustard, baby choy. Find oh, the growing wow. baby bok choy. Yeah, right. yeah. So to give you an example here. This is amazing. Uh, I thought these only come from China. <laughs> <laughs> so 317. So now this crop is ready to pick. Oh. It's grown for less than a month. So since the 13th, it, it was seeded on the 17th of March. Mm -hmm. right, and it's ready to harvest now. It, it's uh, by weight, mm -hmm. based on if you were to transplant out. Mm -hmm. In that same amount of time, it's two times the weight. Mm -hmm. As, as you would get for a big bok choy mm -hmm. in a third amount of the time. Hmm. So you're getting six times the value of that product by growing a smaller crop, mm -hmm. even though it's a baby. And then there's also no processing. You cut them and wash them and it's all eaten whole. Hmm. So. Now, question before we move on. Mm -hmm. um, how long does it take for you to replant uh, so, how long does it take for the soil to recycle itself and be prepared to be used again? Mm, it takes a... Well, this is a good example. So, I'll pick this on, um, on Friday, tomorrow, I'll be mm -hmm. picking this. Mm -hmm. The whole crop will be picked and by... I'll wait one week and a half, it'll be composted 
again and replanted to the next crop. The next crop will will be another family. So I move into carrots. Maybe ah, I'll move into I spinach. See. And that's diversity that you were talking mm -hmm. about. And then there's crop rotation in here. That rotation. So I'm not accumulating pathogen pressure. I see. So because this system works like this, I use no pesticides in this house. I have never used a pesticide in this house, organic or otherwise. So how do you keep out the insects and the, of course, the birds? Roots mm. and well, the keep? birds we chase away. Yeah. But the, the insects are a big difference because yeah. insects and, and fungi come with weakness. Mm -hmm. So if we show no weakness, then the attack is minimal, if, if ever. <laughs> so we see endemic things show up, maybe aphids occasionally. But if they come, because we're not spraying this and the soil is a strong help, you see this you know, rich organic earth here. Yeah, I touch it. Please. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. So it's high organic matter. It's very much alive. There's a lot of worms, there's a lot of spiders, there's a lot of ladybugs. So the fact that there's a living system in place already, if aphids do show up, their predator exists already in the system. So there's no addition of them, they just are here. Can you input that and put them, say for instance, there weren't enough of those? We like, did originally, but we okay. don't need to anymore. You don't need to because of course they... Yeah, regenerate. but many people do continually, even in most, in, in a, a less common, you know, a more common system, that would be the regular. They would, they would actually add ladybugs every couple of months. Swiss chart. Chart. Yeah. And just the end of them, they've been producing all winter. You can see now they're starting to bolt the flower. So this is the last Beautiful. Beautiful. Beautiful they are. Beautiful. So the bed gets pulled up. This, this is an example of this. That this bed has just been finished. This was all in carrots. So the bed got pulled up. I would come through and uh, you know pull out any extra weeds that might have grown under those, which really aren't okay. that many. Okay. We we pull through, pull out these guys, and now, like I said, we'll let this bed sit for a week, and then we produce compost on the farm. We have a full recycling system on the farm. All, all animal waste, all vegetable waste, kitchen scraps, all those materials come back, and we manage that material. Um, and then that compost, we make a particular type of compost just for this soil, and it comes back in. And we amend in the very, very smallest amount possible over the surface. So it's not a lot of material all at once, just constant, regular addition of small amount of material, which is enough to, from a perspective of a community, the community could produce enough to gain back and put into the garden. It's one thing I think is a real empowering thing for all communities, I, I would say almost everywhere, is the use, the way that we use manures and the way that we use green mass and then we forget that um, how important it is to bring that material just it's not just about putting manure back in the soil it's about allowing it to be decomposed allowing it to be mixed with other materials like straw hay green vegetable waste you know any of these other things plus those manures um, have them work blended and that material back in the soil is there's no need for fertilizer or something like it's, that. This, that's what I need. I'm, I'm, yeah. I, I'm listening very, very closely because, <laughs> yes, that's... Yeah. Um, so, one question again. Um, I, I noticed that this part of the, the soil uh, pretty much isn't waiting, so it's drier than the other. So, during the period of uh, waiting, you do not... What, do you continue to water it or you don't? We don't because we want to make sure that the... Uh, that there's the right moisture for when we prepare the bed again. And no. It's not. It only looks dry on the surface, but there's plenty of water below. Of course, of course. Yeah, especially so. if you're watering the neighboring uh, the the area mm -hmm. as well. Amazing. Yeah. And um, of course, uh, most of these also go into commercial uh, to to feed the community and, and so on and so forth. Uh, probably those restaurants who are lucky could probably get from you as well. Yeah, in the city, if, if you're yeah. lucky, obviously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, we sell very quickly okay. because uh, because we produce so steadily. There's never one big, huge. This is the economic part of this that I look at. That's steady. So I know what this house is worth by the day, square foot per day per functioning space, because I know how expensive this house is to run and labor 
and all the other things that go in. So that gives me my idea of what my square foot value is. So once I understand what that is, this is by the day. So it accumulates value over time. So I know that if the crop can't be ready, if the, if the crop can't receive the value that it's worth in the house, then I move it to a new space and it gets out of the greenhouse. That may be seasonally, that may be all entirely, mm -hmm. but I know that I also know how I can sell my vegetable at many different stages of growth. Mm -hmm. And I know that I can produce crops steadily, planting weekly, selling weekly, and then my customer is never lost. And also my labor is methodical. And steady. Because my, they know that every week they'll replace 12 of these beds and they'll be harvesting from 20 of these beds. And the list to the restaurant will be 75 pounds of salad, 100 pounds of spinach, um, 100 pounds of carrots. And so I don't have to, on any one month or another, run out and find a bunch of customers to buy 1,000 pounds of carrots. Because they're expecting. And last week they get 100 pounds, in four weeks they'll get 100 pounds. You know, every week they'll keep getting the same amount and they can regulate. Uh, I try to tell the customers that I have, especially restaurants, you know, remind them that we're not a distributor, we're just a farm. And that the season is like a big accordion, you know. Yeah. So we try to balance it so we can produce food for them on a regular basis, but uh, not every season hands the same plan. So we have to we adjust heavier plantings in this season mm -hmm. so that they come out longer. We may, we may plant all of our spinach in October that we harvest in January, February, March, April. We may plant once in April and harvest for three weeks in May. It, it all depends. I, it's amazing. I have a question for you, though. Uh, since you said the, the farm started about seven years ago, uh, it's been primarily animal husbandry until you came and you brought in, expanded it into all these areas. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to build an economic module into this farming? Uh, into this farm? Well, this type of system I've been doing inside of hoop houses that cost me you know, a couple thousand dollars to build a house inexpensive and I could pay for those houses in a year so I had never really thought about the economics so deeply but when I came here and they asked me they wanted me to build this house put up this house so when I showed up I just saw the footprint of this house they had already chosen that this was the building the, the, the organization had decided that this was the house they wanted to put up so the model was not in place and they said all right can you do what you were doing in this and I said, well, I could do it, but I don't know if it will pay for itself. Because it's a very different model. We're talking about, uh, you know, several hundred thousand dollar infrastructure instead of, uh, like, two or three. So I had to look at it in a different way, more of a, a, an overtime investment. You know, the good thing about this compared to one that takes less of an investment is that this lasts a very long time. And that it actually is a, a really incredible environment to work in because there's so much space. So... There are benefits to this, so that we had to recognize those benefits. So the first thing I did was I built two small houses to prove that, to show that as the example, and to show that this space is a little bit excessive for the sake of just production. I mean, where we're standing, I may never have had a concrete walk in this, with certain things, but we set it up in a way that we can teach 150 students in this room at once. So now we incorporate education into the tool of value of the farming practice. But the more we do this, the more I recognize that that's not entirely necessary, that education is part of it. If you educate your community, then, and you educate yourself about what you should be growing to match the community, then everything seems together. It, it, and it, you, the economics start to show themselves. So, uh, if I were not to listen, if I were just to judge a commodity and grow it in this space, uh, I would, it would be much more difficult for me. And also, I wouldn't be able to maintain the health of the system. So, I mean, first ecology of all, driving economy through a social 
<laughs> Clearly. No. And that, that makes you a pioneer in this field. There are very few of you that are doing things like this today. And uh, you, are, you, you, don't, you, you are using your creativity uh, rather than uh, a predetermined set of education system or curriculum that you're following. You are engaging things differently than it's, it's pr pretty much perhaps a uh, knowledge that's once lost that you are reviving. Well, I think that it's not entirely lost, but certainly hidden. Hidden, <laughs> hidden, hidden, hidden. It is, uh, hidden. and I believe that it's something that, that's why, and there's the generation of, uh, you know, my age group and younger. Uh, I know I've searched for other people that are in my space, and there's not a lot. And more and more. How many? How, how many? How many? How many well, of I don't course. Know, we could probably count them. <laughs> exactly. So I think I think that makes you really uh, a, a, a pioneer in in. Uh, <laughs> you know, the statistic here is that, uh, you know, a huge percentage of the farmers in this country are over 65. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, you're a young so man. Yeah, everywhere, everywhere, the farmers are just. Just aging. Right, and their children aren't picking it up. No. Their, their children right. are scared of what their parents right. have created. Right. Because their parents are sitting in debt. Well, this is this is a matter of survival. But I just want to also um, quickly mention about first thank you for your generosity. Hey, I mean, let's walk. I want to give you carrots. <laughs> it's so wonderful. Watch so, the water on your phone. Okay, thank you. So as um, the the fact of the matter that you you have this capacity and you're willing to. Uh, to show students and things like that, mm -hmm. it's just phenomenal. I, uh, again, I, I'm very excited about the fact that uh, you might be interested in, um, in, in in teaching others. Shall we follow you or just wait here? You can stay there. Okay. This is Carlos right, right from the ground. <laughs> no way! <laughs> No way. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> oh, this is, this is too precious. <laughs> oh, Jack. <laughs> well, I currently see animals. They are, but not so much. Oh, okay. They're not so oh. This is this is great. This is this is great. This is great. <laughs> oh, amazing! <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> just smell it for us. Just just smell it and see. Them. It is amazing. Mmm. Mmm. All right. Yeah. Mmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, give you an idea here. You know, we just picked maybe a third of a pound mm -hmm. of carrot. Mm -hmm. This bed will give me 250 pounds of carrot. Ooh. Just this bed alone. This just is actually. 250 pounds of carrot. And with the tops so fresh this time of year, hmm. you won't find another carrot hmm. in this area. So the economics of this carrot are without competition. So now this is this is where our community relation comes in, is that actually the link is that Thank there's you. money involved, but the money is not the best, that's not the value. The value is the accessibility and the protection. There's so it's hard. And sustaining the community. Because if we're able to get this in all communities, if we're able ever, mm -hmm. then we have a sustainable system. Which right. brings us why this is sustainable agriculture. Well, and we could say that, you know, maybe it's ambitious to say that, to say that the world's going to change in this way. The point of it is that it's not that difficult to do, and if the community has the energy to empower themselves mm -hmm. to, to produce the food on their mm -hmm. own, they can. It doesn't mean that everyone will, mm -hmm. and that every community has the ability to do that. 
and I'm going to ask you a straightforward question now because we, we've come to the point that I was trying to drive at before, is that you may you are open, or promise that you will be open to to help communities like ours coming from Africa to learn more about this kind of agriculture. System. This is why we're here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> certainly, this is a, you know we are a, a nonprofit organization and. We're here as an education tool. So this is the other part of the value, that diversity, when I was talking about ecological diversity being an important tool. Um, diversity for economics is usually the least. Diversity for environmental is next, ecological diversity. And then actually, we are a little more excessive than that because we are creating more diversity for the sake of the social value. So we have a lot more things happening here than one place might do on their own just to have an eco-economic model. Is that the part of this is that we want to show multiple facets and connections between education facility, restaurants, uh, school groups, the farms themselves interacting interdepartmentally, you know, with animals, vegetables, compost operations, fruit, and that all these, these areas kind of work together with each other. It doesn't mean that every farm should look exactly like this. It's that there should be components of all those things and that no one works alone. Self-sufficiency is not what it is. It's, it's communal sufficiency. Right. Which is what and that's what we need to remember, that we're all professionals and we all want to share with each other what we're trying to get out. Mm -hmm. Instead of uh, the farmer becoming a subservient you know, and always having been told, told, told. And so in the long run, their ethic is lost for the sake of an economic model that is, you know, bigger. You're wonderful, sir. Yeah, wow. You're wonderful. I, I think this is why I left the market uh, and came to the uh, non-profit sector. And um, I, 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 it reminds me more that this is where it all comes down. This is what it comes down to. This is, this is where it all ties in together that how do you sustain the community? Before politics, before anything else, people need to be fed. Before you ask for your rights, people need to be fed. And it's important to understand the philosophy behind the farming process and what the duty of the farmer or expectation from a farmer is. That mm -hmm. people really understand the, the importance of the farmer. And, and that the, the farming issue is, as you mentioned, is not a subservient role. Rather, it is, um, it is, it is, it is a deep-rooted, um, compassionate, essential community service. Uh, it's, you know. To some extent, yeah. I mean, if you look at the, the, uh, the, the kind of profit they would have. They, You've got to depend on the farmer for your health. They're making in relation to industry. Oh, well, but uh, yeah, but yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not going to go stuff. there to the industries. The industries are, you know, we can't touch but, them. But that's the, the, I mean, and in that kind of relationship, it... we need to get this, especially in, in communities that I am planning to serve, um, areas where people need to learn so much about what it takes to actually get product out of the soil and what the process is and. Uh, being able to maintain uh, the crops and the climate, climatic conditions and things like that. Mm -hmm. Being able to be creative and changing the mindsets of farmers who are used to, who've been used to a method of farming for over 100 years and that method of farming might not be efficient. And I need to be able to convince them to say, as a matter of fact, this is perhaps a better approach and these are the proofs for that. Right, isn't there a quality of life and included in this whole thing as opposed to just producing. So, yeah, I wonder how that, I, I think about that a lot. We had a, an interesting forum a while back with some plant breeders that came here to speak about uh, the empowerment of farmers saving their own seeds and also the way that uh, the system works, uh, you know, advanced genetics and the use of modification and all these yeah. things. Yeah. For good or bad, the, the use and patenting and those, the, some of the issues and regulations there are very restrictive, um, and the, the idea of the golden rice has come up. What know, is that? Which, uh, which is the, the genetic rice that has beta-carotene 
inserted, basically, so that the rice now can produce vitamin A. Oh. Generally, it's not doing that. How, so how, uh, this is how acceptable is genetics. that? Uh, how acceptable is that? In, in well, the, the difficulty with it... Uh, the pros and cons, if you will. You know, the pros are, in a place like uh, Central Africa, where there may be communities, large communities, where no one's getting enough vitamin A, and that really the, the, a lot of the medical issues are nutritional issues. So if people could increase their nutrition, uh, you know, they can, they can really make a significant difference for all the health issues that are happening. So the, on the benevolent side of it, giving someone a grain that can also, which, you know, rice is not necessarily, you know, it's just is replacing things like, like millet and these things that may have existed in these places. You're giving them a new grain. So it's it's good in the way that hypothetically because here's this real this product that could essentially be the only thing they eat and they live right so but that's for the the leanest group um, but it doesn't necessarily empower those groups above them it, it may help to stabilize the most impoverished so there's a function for it but in general it's not a wholesale fix. It's just a, a bandage for this group. So a lot of people oppose to it because they say, well, people should eat a balanced diet. People should be uh, eating more greens and all these different things. But we're talking about, I mean, it's not unlike here. We're talking about generations. If you lose a generation that doesn't know how to maintain the land, regardless of what our ancestors had done to maintain the health of our, our people, that you just miss one generation and it's done and we need to find a way to regain that no matter where we're from so this is kind of a this is a really big thing this is what we're trying to recognize is that you know in this country we've missed because we've industrialized which has been for good but we've also lost all our, our empowerment to know how to do it ourselves and that same thing is happening there so this is another one of those things it's it's a catch there's a catch to it. Well, here's a, here's a product that you'll be all fine about, but you won't be able to grow it yourself. You'll have to get it from somewhere else. Thank you. Yeah.